Okay, hello and welcome everyone. If you haven't joined us before, my name is Norani Lejon and I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre, one of the academic centres based at the University of London's Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. And if you'd like to find out more about the Centre's events and projects, including our annual conference next month, Human in the Machine, Digital Rights and AI, which takes place on the 23rd and 24th of November, please sign up to our newsletter and check out the Information Law and Policy Centre on our blog and other social media. Now, it is my very great pleasure to chair and introduce our excellent panel of speakers today. Ms. Maureen Corhey is our lead speaker and will be presenting her latest work with us, a work in progress as part of her ongoing PhD in law. Ms. Corhey is a visiting scholar of the ILPC and the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, where she is currently completing work on her PhD, which she is undertaking at the Faculty of Law at the University of Liège in Belgium. Prior to her PhD, Maureen was a teaching assistant at the Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Procedure. She holds a master's degree in criminal law from the University of Liège and an LLM in public international law from the University of Nottingham. Her research interests include Belgian and European criminal law, human rights law, public international law, and cybercrime. Following this main presentation, an intervention will be provided by our discussant, Dr. Martin Husevec. Martin is an assistant professor of law at the London School of Economics and Political Science, LSE. His scholarship deals with questions of innovation policy and digital liberties, particularly intellectual property law, platform regulation, and freedom of expression. Martin obtained his PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Innovation and Competition and Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich for his work on injunctions against intermediaries in the EU, published by Cambridge University Press in 2017. He has held visiting appointments at several leading academic institutions also, including Stanford Law School, the European University Institute and Cambridge University. Martin has previously acted as an advisor to the president of the Slovak Constitutional Court national ministries in Europe and Asia, and various EU institutions. His work has also been repeatedly cited by advocate generals at the Court of, of Justice of the EU. And finally, and of particularly great relevance to today's seminar, Martin is currently finalizing his book on European regulation of digital platforms, principles of the Digital Services Act, which is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. In terms of the format for this seminar, when both speakers have presented, we'll open up the discussion for a Q&A, and we'll try to address as many questions and your comments as possible in the remaining time that we have. So now I'd like to thank both of our speakers and you again for joining us today. And I'll invite Ms. Corhey to present her very exciting paper on private actors under the Digital Services Act and the e-evidence regulation, guardians of fundamental rights or the king's hand. Maureen, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for, for the introduction, Nora. Okay, um, so um, I want to situate a bit uh, why I'm actually writing this paper and doing this work in progress. So my PhD thesis is actually about the role of uh, service providers in the context of direct cross-border cooperation with law enforcement authorities uh, regarding the access to electronic communication data. I'm looking at uh, this topic through the lens of the right to respect for fundamental rights, which are like private life and the right to protection of personal data under the charter of the EU. Um, and I'm also focusing on the broader issue of whether private actor can and should play a role in the protection of fundamental rights. And all this role in such case should be framed or reframed. Um, what I'm going to do today, so it's a, the work in progress, as Nora mentioned, um, it's about this trend to involve private actors in cross-border enforcement. Uh, I'm going to look at two recent instruments that have been adopted at the EU level, which is the evidence regulation and the Digital Services Act. Um, I'm going to address the role of private actors and also look at the division of responsibilities between public authorities and private actors in the protection of fundamental rights. And then I'll answer the question uh, that Nora just uh, uh, eloquently uh, mentioned, which is, are these private actors uh, the guardian of fundamental rights or the kings? And, and I will also give like a bit of insight about uh, what is happening at the UK level. Um, 
So where where does this phenomenon come from? So uh, this is directly linked to the development and the spread of uh, ICTs, so information and communication technologies and the cross-border nature of the internet and big players that have been taking more and more space, uh, which means that now law enforcement authorities uh, found themselves in a position where it has become ne necessary to uh, require the cooperation of those actors in order to access data, to moderate content online, for instance, and so on. And this set of circumstances has also created space for uh, private actors to actually play an active role. Some authors even talk about a proactive role, um, especially where there are regular regulatory gaps. Um, so um, I'm going to start with the evidence. Um, so the evidence that was adopted, the framework that was adopted in July, it's actually two instruments. It's the, a regulation and a directive. Uh, so what does this regulation do? It actually institutionalizes a new criminal justice paradigm of direct cooperation between judicial authorities and private actors, which they, um, which are co the ones that are covered as service providers. And it has been called as a privatization of mutual recognition due to the fact that instead of having mutual recognition between two public authorities, which is how it usually works in the sphere of criminal justice, you have now a cooperation between a public authority and a private actor. So the regulation creates European Productions Order and European Preservation Orders for stored data. Uh, this will allow a member state, uh, the, the, one of their issuing authority, competent authority, to con directly contact a service provider and request data to be preserved or uh, produced. Um, what the, the regulation does, it sets a full system of enforcement and it also sets penalties in case of non-compliance by service providers. And then the directive is here to ensure that uh, orders will be received at, at least one, there will be at least one addressee in the European Union. And it, like the obligation for service provider is to designate a designated establishment or a legal representative in a member state. Um, so now what about the role of service providers in the evidence regulation? Um, I think people who have been studying this topic know that it's a very controversial topic, uh, especially in the field of the evidence. Uh, I will not get back to this. Uh, loads of academics have been uh, writing about these topics and uh, including myself about the role, uh, divergences of opinion of uh, the EU institution. Um, what I want to say first about the role of this actor is that the overarching principle of the regulation is that service providers must comply with orders. We no longer have requests like we had in the context of voluntary cooperation, uh, for instance. Um, what is what for me is going to demonstrate the role that they can play is found in the uh, justification and grant for refusal that can be used by service providers once they are uh, faced with a problematic orders, for instance, uh, and also the information that is provided to them and the amount of confident confidentiality that they have to respect in relation uh, to orders. So what we have is preservation orders and production orders. Those orders, they contain information which will be contained in a certificate. This certificate will be sent to the service providers and it will not contain all the information, especially what will be omitted is the proportionality and necessity assessment of the order and the summary description of the case, which we could argue it's be hard for service providers to have a fully fledged uh, for the matter of assessment without that. But I still think looking at the amount of information that will be in the order, especially given that service provider have been like handling uh, law enforcement requests for the past decades, that the information that they will have, the data categories, the, the type of offense uh, and such thing will actually allow them to spot like problematic orders in terms of fundamental rights. Then the question is, what can they do in those situations? Do they have any like ground, any way to actually oppose uh, such orders? And when you read your evidence regulation, the first thing that you see is that the justification that can be given by service providers not to comply at the execution stage it's mainly linked to technical and practical issues like de facto impossibility. Uh, we don't have the data, this kind of justification. There is also, uh, and it wasn't there until very late in the negotiation, 
uh, the idea that they can uh, raise issue with immunities and privileges and also uh, the rules on the de determination of or limitation of criminal liability that relate to freedom of the press or freedom of expression. Um, which I think it's quite significant. Uh, and then there is this ground which covers other reasons. Uh, and you think, okay, this could be a, um, a ground for service providers to actually uh, raise, take a human rights uh, box. But actually, if you look at re the recitals of the... Um, of the regulation, and if you look at the annex, you see that this is not the main goal of this uh, of this um, of this justification. Mm -hmm. So now that we have addressed the execution stage, uh, there is another stage that is foreseen by the regulation, which is the enforcement stage. Which means that if the service provider doesn't comply, it, the member state where it's located is going to step in. Uh, if required by the issuing authority. Uh, in this case, then the service providers could also uh, provide reasons for uh, not complying with, uh, with orders. And then finally, um, there is a very important detail, especially in terms of like uh, exercise of rights for the data subject, which is that uh, orders will be confidential, which is of course uh, an element that is essential for criminal investigation and the nature of it. It means that service providers will not be able to notify their users of what's going on. Basically, uh, it will be for the issuing authority to decide to rest to to inform the person. They will be in charge of that, so there will be no role of the service provider in this. It goes back to the issuing authority, and this uh, has to be justified under the law enforcement directive. Um, so now when we look uh, we look at the division of, of responsibilities, uh, what do we see? So we see that we have uh, three different actors. So we have an issuing authority, we have a service provider, a private actor, and we also have an enforcing authority in certain cases, which I'm going to explain now. So uh, I'm going to start with like the way the regulation delineates the responsibilities that the main responsibility lays with the issuing authority. It's the, the place where the person concerned will have to go to seek remedies, challenge the, the legality of the measure, including the necessity and proportionality of the order. Uh, the enforcing authority is going to play a slightly different role depending if we're like in front of like a notification process or uh, the enforcement procedure and will provide some sort of extra layer of protection, but it will have very limited protective functions. Um, and finally, service providers under the evidence regulation have an exemption of liability for prejudice they could cause to uh, which ex ex exclusively results from compliance in good faith with orders. And what is the other coin of the other side of it is that if they refuse to comply, there are penalties that are um, that are provided by the regulation and that must be implemented at national level. Um, so the first scenario is going to be for European preservation orders, production orders that concern subscriber data, data requested for the sole purpose of identifying the user, which is, are normally traffic data, but they have been separated for uh, the purpose of the regulation. And you have also EPOS for traffic and content data that concern national cases. So in those cases, you're going to have an interaction only between the issuing authority and the service providers. If the service provider complies, in principle, it will be exempt from any prejudice it may cause. The issuing authority will be the place where the person goes to um, to uh, seek remedies. But I think there is a catch um, in the fact that despite this regulation, service providers are still subject to the GDPR. Um, so I think we can legitimately ask what would be the consequences of, of this, of like a violation of, of privacy data protection. Um, and especially when we know that um, the the Court of Justice of the European Union has made it clear that even when service providers cooperate with law enforcement authority, they remain subject to the GDPR, which allows for less leeway than the law enforcement directive. So I think it would be interesting to see all these three instruments like interact with each other. Um, 
A second scenario is uh, in case of prediction order that concern traffic and content data to have been considered as the most intrusive orders. And in those situation, um, the issuing authority is gonna have to send the certificate simultaneously to the service provider and to the enforcing authority. What is the consequence of this? The consequence is that uh, the, um, the notification is going to have a suspensive effect, so uh, for a maximum of 10 days, which in that during that time, the service provider uh, is uh, must wait <laughs> and to uh, execute the order. Um, it can be less than 10 days if the enforcing authority simply decide to let the, issue, the service provider and the issuing authority know that they're not going to uh, raise a ground for refusal. Uh, among the grounds for a refusal that the enforcing authority can raise, you have loads of grounds that are actually linked to sovereignty, like nebisinidem uh, and like double criminality and such kind of things. But you also have a fundamental rights clause, which has a wording that is different from the wording that we have in the open investigation order and has been criticized for that. It's only in manifest, uh, in case of manifest breaches, it like it takes the languages of some of the cases in the context of the open arrest warrant. Um, so as I said, I think the protective functions of that uh, authority have been quite restricted, curtailed. Um, and finally, um, we have the procedure enforcement, which happens when the service provider refuses to comply with uh, a preservation order or production order. So in this context, you're going to have uh, a dialogue between the issuing authority, the enforcing authority uh, along the way. The enforcing authority is going to contact the service provider asking why the service provider doesn't comply, uh, specify that the service provider can oppose the execution of orders. And in this context, uh, the service provider has at his disposal a certain amount of grounds, which equals the grounds that can also be used by the enforcing authority minus the fundamental rights clause that I just mentioned. Uh, and an important aspect in, in this uh, system is that the final decision will belong to the enforcing authority to decide whether or not to enforce. Uh, and in all of this, I think the enforcing authority, there is the question of the responsibility of that authority. What is the extent of their responsibility if they actually fail to uh, spot uh, orders that are actually abusive, for instance? Uh, for service providers, if they decide to comply, uh, it's... Um, so if they decide not to comply, it's going to lead potentially to penalties. Uh, the penalties, it's 2% total worldwide annual turnover of service providers preceding financial year. Uh, it's um, It can go up to that point and it has to be provided by uh, under national law. Um, just to give like a comparison, when this was suggested by the council um, back during the negotiation, it was considered that this would create like um, an incentive for like service provider to actually oppose uh, the execution of orders. So finally, we're gonna have like the system where uh, potentially we have the issuing authority, we have the enforcing authority with some like responsibility that should be determined. We have the service provider with an exemption of risk of liability for prejudice, but at the same time, the service provider has its own obligation under the GDPR. Uh, and I think finally, in the end, uh, in practice, the way it's going to play is that the final decision is going to be for the enforcing authority to enforce, but only the service providers can provide the data in practice. And that, I think, despite the fact that we are like now have orders with like strict condition, I think in practice uh, that gives them some sort of, uh, of leeway in uh, in protecting fundamental rights. Okay, now that we are finally out of the evidence, uh, I want to look at the Digital Services Act. Um, the Digital Services Act is a, is a complex instrument. It's meant to create a set of comprehensive set of rules to regulate responsibilities and due diligence obligation of providers of intermediary services, uh, including some obligation to cooperate uh, in enforcement. The DSA takes a gradual approach uh, depending on the, on, on the service provided and also on the size 
of intermediaries. Um, the objective, uh, which is very uh, ambitious, is to reduce arms and counter risk online. It's also to promote transparency and accountability about intermediaries practices, terms of services, and content moderation processes. And all of this globally is meant to safeguard user fundamental rights and freedom online and facilitate innovation. So the, the Digital Services Act uh, has been discussed a lot, especially regarding content moderation. But here I'm going to focus on co what I call cooperation duties, uh, because it did allow some problems to be drawn with uh, the evidence regulation. So I'm going to look at orders to act against illegal content, orders to provide information and notification of suspicion of criminal offenses. So I'm going to start with uh, orders to act against illegal content and orders provide information. What the DSA does is setting some minimum condition to be met by those orders. For instance, the information that has to be provided to the service provider, the territorial scope. Uh, the DSA does not provide a legal basis uh, for such order. It has to be found in uh, to be provided under national law. The difference with the evidence is that Despite the language of the DSA, those orders are actually not properly orders. There is no obligation for intermediaries to give effect, uh, so to act against illegal content or to provide information, only to inform of any follow up, to inform the issuing authority of any follow up giving to, giving to given to orders, and. The DSA leaves like a margin of appreciation and discretion for intermediaries on how they're going to act. And I think it's quite, um, it gives them space to, um, to actually play a role in the protection of fundamental rights. Uh, but there are some important elements as well, which is the interaction of the DSA with other instruments. Uh, for instance, um, the DSA mentions that it is without the conditions set in the DSA for those orders, it's without prejudice of other legislative acts, such as like the evidence regulation, meaning that the condition may have to be adapted or dropped if this uh if they are conflicting. Um it's also different for any evidence because the information that has to be provided to intermediaries, uh the issuing authority is really gonna have to justify why. They want a service provider to act, to act against illegal so why they want the information for which what are the reasons behind what do they think this person did what is the infringe like what is the the offense committed um but here again like especially like in terms of notification normally uh for those orders the service provider is meant to inform the person concerned of like of the follow-up given of the remedies available but here the dsa derogates this in case of a uh, criminal investigation. So it like again criminal investigation reduces the margin of of, of maneuver of private actors. Um so what is what what uh, what do service like intermediary have to do with uh, with those orders? Well it mentioned the DSA mentions an effect that has been given. So for orders to act against like illegal content that can go from disabling to removing content. There is no no uh no condition set on this. Uh, it doesn't say if the service provider or the intermediary has to respect the territorial scope imposed by uh in the order uh, of the issuing member state. Um, when it comes to orders to provide information, uh, it requires service providers to uh, provide specific information. And here the goal is basically to enable the identification of the recipient concerned. Uh, and also uh, there is a limitation that I think is quite significant, which is that uh, this information, it cannot go beyond like what the service providers has already under its control. So it does not create like extra data retention obligation. Uh, but uh, here again, the trick is that it's this is without prejudice. Uh, where said where Salter forty four says that it's without prejudice to retention and preservation rules under applicable national law in compliance with union law. So, if under national law they have to um, retain some data information for as long as it complies with um, with union law, especially the jurisprudence of the court, then this uh, could be used to uh, to gather information uh, from uh, intermediaries in this context. So now we have the last uh, one uh, of these cooperation duties, which is the notification of suspicion of criminal offenses. Under Article 18, uh, this 
uh, between what I just said concerned all intermediaries, this this notification of suspicion of criminal offenses only concerns hosting services, including online platform. So this is sort of like a crime reporting obligation. Uh, it's about information giving rise to a suspicion that a criminal offense involving a threat to the life or safety of a person or person has taken place, is taking place or is likely to take place. So it covers past, present and future threats, but it's it's limited to like a specific situation, which is like the life and safety of a person. Um, it has, however, it has been criticized for having a very broad scope. Uh, uh, doesn't say much about what a suspicion entails, we simply know from we say, Rice Hatel 56 that the suspicion has to be reasonably justified, having regard to all relevant circumstances of which the intermediary is, is aware. Um, and also the service providers has to uh, provide all the relevant information available to the authorities concerned. So it's actually a lot of information. It could be the content in question, the time when the content was published, explanation of why it suspects that this uh, this uh, this content is uh, a criminal offense and information that are necessary to locate and identify actually the recipient of the service. So it goes quite, quite far. Um, so I think that in this context, I kind of see... Um, the DSA putting uh, intermediary in a role of sentinel, but the issue is that the control of this role of this role has not been fully uh, defined, which could be uh, problematic in terms of fundamental rights protection. Um, okay, so what about now the division of, of responsibilities? Uh, so clearly what we just saw we could have it could have an impact it has an impact on freedom of expression the right to respect for private life and the protection of personal data uh the dsa it only sets some conditions for orders to uh to act against illegal content and orders to provide information there is some discretion left to member states and there is still space compared to the evidence for self-regulation by private actors so that could actually blur the lines of responsibilities but I think that um, here there is a concept, um, an issue, or like rather, uh, yeah, I think we can, I think the, um, the right expression is uh, a concept of delegated enforcement, which means that the one, like the, the legislation expects uh, private actors to, uh, to act as enforcer of the law and then force them with various tasks. And in those situations, the state is going to retain the responsibility. It cannot just shift liability just by um, giving um, task to uh, to private actors. This is found in the Open Court of Human Rights case law in relation to content moderation and overblocking of content, and also recently by uh, the Court of Justice, especially its Advocate General, in uh, a case that I've been spoken a lot about, which is on Article 17, of the directive on copyright in the digital single market. Um, so yeah, I think this is like an interesting uh, topic to discuss uh, in the context of the DSA because I think this could actually apply uh, in, the, in those circumstances. So just quickly uh, to finish on the DSA, um, a difference with the evidence is that for orders to act under Article 9, Article 10, there is no procedure enforcement. Uh, this has this has to go again to be provided uh, under national law. Uh, it, it's not regulated by the DSA, and uh, these orders are part of the liability regime of service providers uh, for notification of suspicion of criminal offenses. Uh, actually, in the situation, uh, due diligence obligation uh, may give rise to the violation of those obligation may give rise to penalties. Uh, and very similarly to uh, Article 15 of the Events Regulation, we have a percentage of the company's global revenue, but here it goes from 2 to 6% uh, of uh, the global revenue from the preceding uh, year, financial year. So quite a lot of consequences for, again, like failing to, to comply. So I'm just going to hand here and like, yeah, I'm trying not to, to respect the, the timing. Um, so what we have, I think we see different approaches under the evidence regulation and the DSA. They are, of course, very different instruments with different goals. Uh, 
the evidence is really like the overarching goal of the framework is to improve access to electronic evidence cross border uh, situation. It's no longer a question of request, but it's an explicit order to cooperate, which means that it leaves little margin to service providers to uh, to act to uh, to play a role. Uh, in comparison, the DSA only sets minimum requirements. Uh, it gives space to intermediaries to decide and regulate themselves, and also quite a lot of discretion to 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 member state. Um, so, to the question of our private actors, the guardian of fundamental rights, or are they the king's end? I think it calls for a nuanced answer. Uh, sorry to disappoint. <laughs> uh, maybe people are expecting me to say like, no, they are or they aren't. No, I think uh, even if you look at the evidence regulation, of course we are in front of orders and we have penalties and we have this whole exemption of liability for service providers. So it would be, people would say it's easier for them to comply, they have to. But I think theory in practice will be very different, especially given the consequences that could be uh, suffered by companies for actually complying with some orders that are problematic in terms of fundamental rights. And I think this is very important to keep in mind. Um, for the DSA, I think that Intermediaries are still way more in the in the driver's seat, which gives them way more like leeway for playing a role in the protection of fundamental rights. Uh, but there is also this, even though we could see this um this um this margin as a good thing, I also think that the fact that some of the scope of the obligation are imprecise is actually a risk, meaning that uh, it could be interpreted very broadly per member state imposing very uh, stringent obligations on uh, on intermediary in this regard, because they, that's a big opportunity um, uh, in this regard. But I think that in the end, uh, for both sector, it's going to be a balance of interest and strategic choices because uh, you have private actor with their own interest. And I think that uh, the protection of fundamental rights, it's still going to be part of their process, whether or not the instruments are actually acknowledging that in legal terms. So these are like my thoughts from now. Uh, I think I'm kind of on time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll let uh, Martin discuss. And then if you have time to reflect on like the broader idea of the role of a private actor, I'll be happy to, uh, to discuss that and to answer questions. Thanks so much, Maureen, for a really impressive and whirlwind tour of two really significant pieces of recent legislation at the EU level. I thought the comparative analysis you did through the prism of the role of providers and intermediaries was uh, very well done. I think there's some very uh, striking relationships between both in terms of all of the issues of legal uncertainty that you highlighted in the in the presentations and quite a striking delegation of the responsibility to be monitoring and enforcing fundamental rights protections both at the member state level and also as well to providers under both frameworks so it was such a rich presentation i want to avoid the trick of uh, asking you all the questions i want to ask you right now marine and i will uh, direct the floor to our expert discussant, Martin. Martin, whenever you're ready, thank you. Thank you, Nora, and thank you, Maureen. This was um, this was really interesting, and I have to say, um, it's it's quite amazing to uh, think about these problems uh, that these new pieces of legislation they're adopted kind of in parallel, very often not co in a coordinated fashion um, um, that they kind of create. Um, I'm not sure whether the people drafting e evidence have been thinking as seriously as you have about the uh, about uh, the interplay with the DSA or, for that matter, with other provisions and other instruments of EU law. For instance, one of the other things that comes to mind, and maybe that's something you want to look at later on, is terrorist content regulation, uh, which which has a slightly more elaborate actually um, system of uh, safeguards, um, at least based on what uh, I gather from your presentation and your paper, which is interesting because TCR has been very controversial, particularly for imposing 60-minute removal uh, um, window. But when you look at the number of safeguards and con contrast is now with the with what would you have presented, it almost seems like a uh, like a walk in a park. There seems to be a lot in there. 
uh, that doesn't seem to be in the, in in this. So part of what I want to do is maybe ask why that is. Maybe there's actual reason for that. Um, but let me start first by saying uh, that, uh, I mean, obviously, I, I, I buy into the framing itself. I, I think the framing of delegation uh, makes a lot of sense here, although I'll, I'll push you on, on some of the points in terms of uh, where we are on the spectrum of the delegation in this specific case. Uh, but let me first make a couple of technical remarks, and then I get to the bigger point. Um, so uh, you discuss in your paper Articles 9 and 10 of the DSA, and, and you give it interpretation that I think I was also giving it when I first read the provision. That is to say, um, uh, it's uh, uh, two provisions imposing basic minimum safeguards for the type of orders that fall in the, uh, in the category of content or information, um, which doesn't cover all the orders, but covers uh, uh, quite, quite a few. The problem with that, and uh, this is something where I have myself changed my view, and I, I want to, for the benefit of all the uh, all all the listeners and the audience, I want to share this with you in the chat. We have recital um, we have recital thirty one uh, of the DSA, uh, which says. Consequently, this regulation should harmonize only certain specific minimum conditions that such orders should fulfill. That's basically in line with what you have been saying. But then it says, in order to give rise to the obligation of providers and intermediary services to inform the relevant authorities about the effect given to those orders. Now, I think uninformed by legislative history, I think you read it as, as, uh, exactly as I used to read it. That is that this imposes a set of minimum requirements for these types of orders. Unfortunately, the legislative history of this appears to be that um, the part in order to give is crucial here. And, and that recital was meant to explain that um, only if you want to have the effect of getting the information from the providers, basically confirming you what they have done using this type of effect, only then you have to comply with the minimum requirements that you find in Article 9 and 10 which has a obviously completely different effect, has the effect of making this optional uh, for the member states, only in case they want to achieve that particular effect of Article 9 and 10, which is to basically get feedback uh, on their orders, which they otherwise wouldn't have to uh, receive in absence of a national provision saying so. Which, in terms of the minimum safeguards, means that there would be basically no minimum safeguards applicable across these two types of orders. Now, I personally think that your interpretation, which is my former interpretation, is probably still defensible. But if you're true to legislative history and what the council really tried to do with this provision, probably you have to give it to them to say that this was meant to be an optional provision for the member states in case they feel that they want to achieve that sort of a feedback effect through Article 9 and 10. Um, but I think, I mean, I've seen some publications that uh, are trying commenting on the DSA and, and they are already picking this up and and arguing basically in the direction that you have been arguing. So um, there is a space for that. Council wanted something, maybe they didn't manage, but I'm just pointing you to this or to this recital because that is arguably what they what they tried to express this, whether they manage or not. That's an, another question and what a court will uh, think about it in this way. So the consequence of this would be then there's no minimal set, set of safeguards actually for, uh, for all this. It's optional minimal set of safeguards in case you want to achieve this effect. To the extent that you care about that effect, you, 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 you comply with them. Now, it has to be said, when you look at those safeguards, they are nothing, um, nothing revolutionary. So um, I think any sensible national legal basis should be able to comply with these requirements. Uh, and as a result, it should be possible to, to basically uh, have orders that comply with these requirements. Uh, so that's kind of a technical point on Articles 9 and 10. Uh, uh, where I'm necessarily not saying you're wrong, I'm just saying that this is the context and uh, I'm not sure what the court will, will will do with this. Now I want to go a little bit to the bigger point. Uh, so you have presented as also in the paper, also in the presentation, basically with a starting point, there's an authority that is issues this and then basically that request goes, uh, travels to, to the provider. And the provider basically has to provide information. There's very little leeway uh, and arguing against it. And unless there's a, a certain type of order, as I understand it, uh, a traffic order, content order, um, traffic data order, content order, there's uh, uh, even this, the, the sort of authority of the country of origin is, doesn't even get involved, which, which clearly, I mean, points to 
uh, another instance where we are outsourcing or at least using the direct relationship between the companies and the states to make certain things more efficient, um, which is you know the same thing we've been doing with content when we allow uh, authorities to issue notices as opposed to orders. Why do we allow that? Because order is procedurally costly. Why do we do what we do in naive evidence? Because it's costly to go through uh, through the uh, international cooperation mechanisms, right? But okay, that's a matter of fact. This is this is where we are now. The bit where I want to a little bit push about uh, the delegation framing, and and I don't necessarily disagree that this is not a situation where there is certain delegation. You have a state authority issuing an order that issue that order is implemented by a provider. So there's certain leeway that a provider has, perhaps, in, in terms of how it complies with that order, uh, in a similar way as if this was a content order. The bit where I'm a little bit, um, uh, I would be a little bit maybe more um, optimistic about the existence of safeguards is the bit that you haven't talked about, and that is who actually can issue that order. Um, so upon a very quick scan, and so feel free to correct me, it seems to me that the issuing authority itself is quite limited under Article 4 of the e evidence uh, regulation, which basically means that when we talk about authority, we might be talking about courts uh, in many cases. Um, and if that's true, that, that's true, then I think the framing that, that you have here is you have a court issuing an order that is directed to the providers, and we're asking to what extent providers should have a possibility to contest what the courts uh, issue. And I think that's a slightly different framing uh, than if this was just any authority, right? I would be imagining, uh, uh, you know, a police or, you know, any other law enforcement authority doesn't have to go through a, a, any sort of a checks ex ante. I mean, if that's true, if I'm not mistaken on that, we have a set of ex ante safeguards on the on the side of the state um, uh, that that precede uh, the existence of that order. And in that case, maybe it's a little bit more understandable that given that leeway than the providers uh, have in terms of implementation, um, uh, in terms of gathering the data and providing it, is a little bit more limited compared to a situation and now I can give you different situations. So one situation where the state authority only issues a notice, so procedurally completely uh, formless uh, thing. There's no procedure basically for this. It's your notification, puts you a notice about some unlawful content. And you have to go and do something because you're worried about your own liability. There's no safeguard on the side of the, of the state issuing this notice. And the only safeguard that you have is basically how the, the company react to this. Even uh, even a content related for this, where basically you have some preventive duties, where you issue as an authority order or, or or the court an order telling the the company the provider to prevent something in the future, would seem to me provide much more of a leeway in terms of implementation than the orders that you're talking about, which are preserve the evidence and then give some specific evidence. Now I'm not saying there's no uh, room. Uh, therefore, kind of implementation, but it seems that 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 red room is much more reduced because there's a specific case, specific information, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to push back a little bit, uh, not necessarily on the framing, but a little bit more. Think about, uh, don't think about a delegation after the order is already out, but think about the delegation already before um, the order is even issued. Because if you're concerned about the safeguards, it would seem to me that that the, the fact how you actually handle these. Uh, these orders in terms of how they issued would be an important safeguard in itself. So it might be quite interesting to contrast this with the TCR, terrorist content regulation, which which um, maybe is, uh, maybe even a little less prescriptive when it comes to the authorities, but includes other types of safeguards that maybe are not in the privacy, uh, sorry, e, 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 um, evidence regulation, such as transparency reports of the uh, of the authorities issuing this. And maybe sort of a follow on. And that's the kind of a safeguards you were uh, quite interested here. How about a follow up? Who can actually contest this? And, and, and I think there's a little bit more in a TCR. I'm not saying there's awfully much, but there's a little bit more in a TCR than, than there seems to be in, in this uh, e evidence regulation. So I just want to invite you to maybe think about a whole cycle of this, even before the authorities get, gets involved. And think about these um, these safeguards that exist along the entire system, because it seems to me that a case for why providers should be able to contest is a little bit weaker 
if we're talking about a specific case where the court was actually involved and there's very little we uh, very little, little wiggle room on the side of the provider when it comes to the implementation so just kind of a, uh, wanted to um, sort of share that as a, as, a, as, a, as a food for thought um uh, related to this, I think what the e-evidence uh, regulation shows is that uh, is this huge uh, hole in the DSA, which are others. Um, and uh, as you might know, others have been this very difficult politically uh, issue where member states cannot agree, do not want to agree, which is why maybe nine and ten are uh, in the shape that they that they are, um, because the member states are just not willing to to harmonize this. <laughs> I think uh, I think that's uh, there's actually by the way one of the things maybe to criticize about a DSA explicitly that that the unlike all the other types of delegations where the state comes in and wants something from the providers when it comes to the orders and again in the e evidence it's courts to some extent but in many other cases these are authorities of any kind that you think about not necessarily even independent because the liability exemptions basically only require that it's an authority, which you know it's a it's a very very broad uh, very broad notion. So I think I think that's maybe part of the problem um, uh, is that uh, for these orders there's no set of universal safeguards, unlike we have for for other type of content when uh, uh, when we don't have an order. Uh, so that's something to to think about. Um, finally, in terms of the um, in terms of the notification of suspected crimes I'm, I'm completely with you i think I'm, I'm the more i think about this and i'm no subject matter expert but the more i think about this with people who have to implement this it, it appears to me that this uh, hasn't been thought through uh really well because the type of crimes that can fall under this provision still is rather broad and you can you, you start thinking about cases where you know there are obvious cases that everyone thinks about social media and and uh you know um and and immediate uh threats to life but how about um, uh, online platforms that provide short-term rental, uh, where they have indications that someone might be spying on you um, with the, with a camera in the, in the accommodations that you're renting? Is that something that is an immediate uh, um, a threat to life? Uh, well, maybe. Uh, but here's an even bigger problem: What is the threshold for triggering any notification to the authority? And basically, the DSA says exactly nothing about this. So. Um, in a situation where you have all the information in your um, in your platform, that I think is that is the scenario they've been thinking about, right? So I have all the information in front of me; I can assess it. But I just give you an example where it's completely off the platform, but still would uh, fall under this provision, and it's just unclear how how that would even um, how they would even work. Uh, so so that's that, that's another set of problems to maybe think about. And then finally, um, and one thing that maybe you might be interested in, given that you're looking at this from the e-evidence perspective, is is to look at the DSA as a measure that prescribes data retention. Uh, so there are numerous provisions in the DSA that implicitly expect the providers to retain data of certain kind for some period of time before the stuff is reinstated, before something ends, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, from the evidence perspective, this is helpful because um, if the company has no a priori obligation to hold the data, one way how to avoid compliance with the e-privacy directive is not to store the data, right? To the extent, obviously, that is compatible with their business model and, and other things they want to do. But uh, so so in a way, you can say that a DSA creates a pool of data for the e, uh, for, um, uh, for for DSA uh, for, for e, e evidence disclosures by basically mandating the retention of this information for a certain period of time, um, which is an intended effect of some of these procedural rights, but uh, it's an effect that I think is clearly clearly there. Finally, and this is my last point, um, it, it might be also worth thinking about, I don't know how far the preservation uh, orders go, but obviously there are uh, individual instances of retention, so they look like a quick freeze sort of types of obligations. Um, but still, it might be interesting to think about the interface between them and the prohibition of general monitoring, which I would say in the digital services context is basically your um, way in for all the case law about indiscriminate data retention. Uh, so basically, the question is to what extent, because the prohibition of general monitoring applies to all these orders, um, 
ultimately, it doesn't matter that they're based on the e, e, e evidence regulation. They, from the DSM perspective, DSA perspective, they come in as orders. They're issued by authorities. They're possible because they're exempted from the liability exemptions. So they have to comply to the extent that the e, e, uh, um, evidence regulation doesn't amend DSA. They have to comply with the prohibition of general monitoring. And that's your entry for the, all the debate about the indiscriminate retention of data. Now, in these cases, I think you have individual disputes. You have a judge. Uh, but still, it might be interesting to think about how far does retention uh, potentially go? So could you have like a, a more uh, a, a broader retention? So if they said, I want to uh, actually uh, collect information on 50 users that conform to these criteria, would that be something in, in, uh, in line with that provision? but also in line with the, the regulation that you're discussing. That's all I have. Thank you very much, Martin. That was a very, very rich set of insights and feedback there, Maureen. So I think it's given you perhaps a lot to think about in terms of some of the very specific technical points that Martin mentioned. Um, but I think the overarching point regarding framing is quite significant. Um, I particularly agreed with your point, Martin, regarding the importance of the ex ante safeguards for fundamental rights in terms of authorization and the scope of the authorities in that they, they're just as significant, perhaps arguably at, in some instances more significant than the ex post safeguards that you focused on quite significantly, Marine. But obviously, it's it's the relationship between both of those. And it'll be very interesting to see when this has been implemented, which public authorities are actually making those particular orders and how that gets represented across various member states, if there's any consistency there when both of these laws get reviewed a few years down the line. I want to give huge thanks to Martin, our discussant, who gave some really fantastic insights and feedback on Maureen's paper. And Maureen, thank you so much for this fantastic uh, work and practice that you shared with us today. Uh, we're all really looking forward to this paper. It's on, I think it couldn't really be more timely in terms of the comparative analysis that you've done here. So Congratulations, Maureen, and thank you so much, Martin, and wishing everyone a lovely evening and looking forward to seeing you all soon again.